overcoming your anxiety, you can do that by activating your salivary response. You're like, huh? The first time I heard it, I chuckled. Mm. Until I was given the research. So here's what happens in the brain and why, for example, chewing on gum or sipping on citrus water when you're anxious. Citrus. Citrus water. It calms your nerves. Interesting. So this is what's happening in the brain. We all have experienced our mouth drying up when we get anxious. Because of the brain's evolution, the amygdala picks up that dried mouth as a signal and it has excellent pattern matching, so to say, from the past evolution. And it says, there is something dangerous happening. here. So I got to go into fight or flight mode because the mouth is dried up. It picks up that pattern as danger and it starts producing cortisol in the brain. So what you're doing, you're essentially physiologically tricking the brain by activating the salivary response to say, look, nothing is threatening me. The brain picks up that new pattern and says, slow down the amount of cortisol that's going in the brain, right? So these are things that are coming from the heart of science and it's validated by multiple papers, multiple institutions, very different experiments. And I'll give you more if you're interested in different dimensions. More examples, man, let's do this. Sure. So improving focus. Okay. And this also is also an edible form, but not everything is you have to eat yeah. or consume, uh, right? But in order to improve your focus, you can chew on peppermint gum. You can improve your focus by up to 67%. Now, really? Peppermint why? gum? Peppermint gum. Huh. So what does that happen? Uh, there is research in biochemistry. And then there's research in neuroscience, which got to the same conclusion completely differently. The biochemists, in two series of research, they found that the act of chewing create, carries more blood to your brain, which in turn carries more oxygen to your brain. Mm-hmm. Rece- other research shows that peppermint has the same impact. Peppermint causes more blood flowing to your brain. So when you chew on peppermint gum, it has a double effect. So that's the... Bi- and when more blood comes to the brain, more oxygen comes to the brain. And oxygen is a responsible for your focus. So the more, if you, have lack of, if you have lack of oxygen, your brain just has a hard time focusing. This is the biochemist side. The neuroscientists, they do their tests with fMRIs and scanning the brain and so on. So I'm here, I'm, what I'm hearing is, is a business opportunity here. Creating. To create gum. Specific. Focus gums. Everyone I'm going to trademark that. it now. Focus <laughs> gum. <laughs> dot com right with a little bit of nicotine in there too with our tagline tropic effect chew on your focus oh, I like that <laughs> billion dollar business right there <laughs> but the neuroscientists do fMRIs and by scanning the brain they notice that the act of chewing is a small enough distraction for the brain for it to not look for another distraction completely different finding a uh, completely different strategy similar findings but it's very easy. So I tell that to founders in Toronto. I've told this to guys running incubators and accelerators. And I kid you not, the next day or three days later, they would send me a long email saying, not that I only tried and it worked for me. I bought packs of peppermint gum and put it on everybody's desk. Right? So we always try to find these kind of techniques from science that are very novel that someone like you who is very well read, who cares a lot about mental peak performance, it's, it's innate in you to, and you've never come across it on a Google search. Do you have any examples of, so the examples you gave me are examples of adding things in your system, in your routine. Next sure. question is, do you have examples of things to subtract? Yes. So another module so every cognitive function in psychology compass usually translates to a module of its own cuz what i like what i like you know sorry to cut you off what i like about psychology compass you're you're taking the theoretical yes so scientific theoretical from psychology neuroscience biochemistry bio, they're behavioral all, economics they're all, they're all together yes you know, they're all interlaced together and then theory aside you know it's good to theorize yes and it's cool that you can replicate it within a study. Yes. But obviously for me, I'm a, I'm a practical human being. Yes. <clears throat> I'm like, what can I fucking do right now? For exactly. And that's the goal here, right? 
Not only that, I would add a second layer, which we care about and I think you care about. Not only what can I do now, which is the practical side, how can I measure the impact on me? Yeah, quantitative. Quantitative, yeah. which is the third pillar we're built on. So research-driven, practical, and with an ROI feedback loop. Because the joke I say, imagine you were on a diet and you didn't have a scale. So you had to go in front of the mirror and see if the diet is working. Right? If, you can't, if, you, if your measurement is subjective, it doesn't work. The same thing goes with the mind. We don't necessarily have a scale that everybody is accustomed to, so we built that scale as well. But to your earlier question, is there things that you can subtract? Yes. So we have all of these cognitive functions in the brain. Ability to focus, communication skills, overcoming anxiety, etc. One of these cognitive functions is decision-making, which you do a lot of it. And believe it or not, in research, and this is something that resonates with me as well, because we all have some default decision-making frameworks that we fall onto. Oh yeah, we're reactive as opposed to responsive. Just exactly. instant. Uh, robot, exactly. Robotic. A robotic, and yeah. it's because if some of us, you know, sometimes we fall into a default decision-making framework that is correct for that problem. Correct. But yeah. a lot of times we just fall on our default, not knowing the type of problem, right? So I'll give you a decision-making framework um, for a certain kind of problem, which is, I'm sure you've been in this situation many times, which is, let's say you have multiple options to choose from, but you must only choose one. You cannot choose two. And it's a little bit of an unknown territory. So an example, a good example, let's say you want to do a marketing campaign to acquire a bunch of users. You can do it on Facebook, you can do it on Google, you can do SEO, you can do it on Reddit, but you can only choose one. And there's so many other variables in, in your mind that are competing with each other. Which one has the biggest reach? Which one has the most targeting? Which one has the lowest cost, right? So how do you make that decision? So research has fun. like, I'm usually a victim in this situation because my default uh, decision-making framework is analytical. It's the computer science brain saying, Get all the parameters, create this massive spreadsheet sheet, build a formula, and then you'll figure out the thing. Or, or the opposite, just close your eyes and throw it against the wall. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> has their default. Model. <laughs> Research finds in this situation, because you can only choose one, pick the most important variable for the campaign that is important. So you might say, the most important thing is cost. I don't care about scalability. I don't care about uh, focus on the demographics of the user. Yeah, just return on ad spend. That's all you care about, yeah. And say, I'll go, I'll choose the option that meets that single variable the best. And research shows that that ends up being the best decision you can make. So these are in terms of removing. So you remove a layer of complexity in your decision making. And scientifically, you end up at a more efficient result. 